The question of how we can visualize an atom and what an atom would look like if we could enlarge it to the size of an apple is probably one of the most popular questions I've been asked in the comments. Well, it's time to get to the bottom of this thing. And as always, this is Yuri Trifonov. Today, we're going to try to imagine what an atom would be like if we enlarged it to the size of an apple. What do we know about the atom? Well, first of all, we know that it's a particle and that the atom itself is also made up of some subatomic particles. The structure of the atom is usually described by the standard classical model, which is the planetary model of the atom proposed by Rutherford. However, modern ideas about the structure of the atom have changed significantly, and Rutherford's model of the atom remains only in school textbooks as the very beginning, so to speak, of any physics student's creative journey. In fact, the Schrödinger model is a much more accurate representation today. But, in any case, let's recall the essence of this model. And generally speaking, the Schrödinger model is not that different from Rutherford's atomic model. There is also a nucleus, but unlike the planetary model, where electrons revolve around the nucleus like planets, here we have a sort of probability cloud representing where the electron might exist. There are some very deep and interesting points here, which by the way leave their mark on the question we're now trying to analyze and consider. In fact, the structure of the atom as represented by the planetary model implies that the electron is a certain constant standard particle that you can touch, and which is also a kind of physical body. But the Schrödinger model of the atom, which is more modern, says that there is a certain probability region where the electron can exist. In other words, to a certain degree of approximation, it may turn out that the electron exists here and here at the same time. This is, as they say, hello and welcome to the peculiarities of quantum physics, and hello and welcome to the traditional classical wave function. And all of this is the defining factor that allows us to imagine the atom in a specific way. So, if we were to enlarge Rutherford's classical atom to the size of an apple, what would we get? We would get the classic model of the atom, which you used to be able to buy in any store. If you remember, there was this model of a perpetual motion machine where there's a central piece and some orbits or something like that revolve around it. That's roughly what the atom would look like according to Rutherford's model if we enlarged it. But that's an outdated view. But if we enlarge the model of the atom that we have now, which is considered the most accurate, what do we get? And what we get is something incomprehensible. Let's highlight a few key points. First of all, since we have electrons that, so to speak, either exist or don't exist, located somewhere around the atom at an indeterminate point, this will be some kind of flickering zone where different particles, particularly electrons, will periodically materialize. And these particles will create a strange tangled cloud of probabilities. It will resemble something like electronic noise. If you remember old screens, there was even a screensaver like that, where various little dots would fly around, creating digital noise, active digital noise. That's roughly what this zone will be like. Somewhere inside this zone will be the atomic nucleus, which we won't be able to see, even if we magnify the atom. And with all that, it's not clear how to visualize any of this, because in fact we're dealing with some kind of strange cloud that has neither a definite size nor shape, and everything exists within certain probabilistic characteristics. The size will be probabilistic, and it could be this or that within a certain range. Its appearance will be blurry, resembling digital noise. And as for the inside of the atom, we won't be able to see it at all. Moreover, there's a high probability that light can't fully interact with the particles we're considering. So, in fact, we might not be able to see the atom in the way we want to see it. Therefore, magnifying the atom to a certain size won't get us anywhere. Next point, if each particle is located at a certain distance from one another, regardless of whether the particle changes its position and is fixed or probabilistically located, there is always some distance between the particles. This distance is determined by a number of parameters, which aren't important for us to discuss right now. But one way or another, these little electrons and the outer particles that surround the atom are also positioned at certain distances from each other, and in fact, it will look like a kind of bubbling foam, like digital noise, where these spikes that represent the appearance of subatomic particles, specifically electrons, will behave in this strange way. Alright, so what we get is something like a tangle, with no shape, no size, something unclear. You can't touch it. And here comes the question about touching. Another popular question that often comes up in the comments under videos about atoms and atomic structure is, what would an atom feel like to the touch if it were large? For some reason, a lot of people are interested in how we can touch matter if, essentially, it consists of empty space. Here, I'll give a characteristic description that I've mentioned more than once in my articles, which we've discussed together several times. In fact, yes, any matter essentially consists mostly of empty space, on the one hand. On the other hand, there's nothing particularly special about that. The simplest way to imagine this is to take two magnets and try to bring their light poles together. Obviously, they will start to repel each other, this repulsion will be felt quite objectively, quite tangibly. 
And when these magnets repel each other, we can quite confidently say that this sensation is a very real physical phenomenon. So why do you have questions about how we touch matter if in fact it mostly consists of empty space? Well, not completely, of course, but let's say it's about 80% empty space. Our particles, subatomic particles, and even deeper levels, so to speak, arrange themselves into certain structures. Whether that's a probability distribution or something else, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that they interact with each other and repel one another. As a result of these particles repelling each other, we get the very effect that we feel when interacting with magnets. We can never actually touch anything, because in reality, what we feel is the constant repulsion of particles. Now let's apply all this to the structure of the atom and how we've imagined it. We said that in order to somehow visualize an enlarged atom, we need to imagine a kind of cloud made up of constantly shifting digital noise. In this cloud we most likely won't see the position of the nucleus and it will just be some kind of abstract bundle of something unclear because what we see are electrons and we don't really know what electrons are or how to try to see them. But now let's try to touch it. What will we feel? Well, it will be some kind of strange substance that also repels objects made of like charged particles. And basically we'll be touching this jelly-like thing in much the same way as we touch, say, a ball. So when we touch this atom ball, we really can feel it. But at the same time, we need to understand that since it doesn't have a definite shape, and since the positions of the particles in this probability cloud are as strange as it may sound, probabilistic, we can't fully touch this thing in the usual sense. We try to grab this ball, but the electrons turn out to be in a different spot. We touch it, but it keeps changing shape all the time. So if we enlarge an atom, we still wouldn't be able to touch it the way we imagine. Moreover, it might turn out that this thing is constantly changing its shape. This thing will constantly change its characteristic size, falling within a certain range of those sizes. And even with all that, it won't even resemble something like a water balloon or anything like that. Here, all these analogies that we always try to use to simplify and improve our understanding of the material are not always straightforward, not always objective. When we try to imagine that we've enlarged an atom to the size of an apple and try to touch it, we don't realize that in reality, an atom surrounded by subatomic particles at the quantum level will behave completely differently and won't resemble an ordinary ball at all.